Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. It's uh, so hard to, to believe that Christmas is less than two weeks away. I don't know where the time goes. Of course, part of that is just from getting older and forgetful. But, I mean, it's remarkable how fast this year has gone. And, you know, we begin each week of this Advent season. It started a couple of weeks ago with the admission that uh, for Sharon and I, and as we've talked with other pastors, uh, both Christmas and Easter are difficult times to preach because the story is so familiar and so uh, precious and you don't want to get anything wrong, but it leaves you kind of struggling for an, for an entry point into uh, talking about the Advent and talking about the birth of Jesus and what it all means. So with that uh, explanation and confession out of the way, uh, as a result of that, we've been talking about other entry points into this story and looking at some of the other issues around, around Advent. Um, the fact that uh, when he was faced with a suspiciously pregnant fiance, Joseph didn't run. When everything in his background and his heritage and, and his uh, tradition and practices said, don't marry her, he did. Last week, we used a portion of Paul's letter to the Galatian church to approach cr the Christmas story when Paul wrote, um, when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, not born as a reigning king or military messiah, but instead born into the same guardianship and custody, as Paul said in that portion of scripture, with the same demands and the same expectations as every Jewish person, except that Christ was on mission to redeem those, these same people under the law, to rescue them from that in order that we might receive adoption to sonship. We don't have to be estranged from our Heavenly Father. We don't have to go through a set of laws to get to the presence of the Father. We can be sons and daughters now. My question last week, and it's preoccupied a lot of my thought this season, is what made this the set time? What made this year, the right year. I mean, what initiated this? And, and why in this place? I mean, because the Galilee is an awfully long way from any seat of power. It's a long way from Jerusalem, the national headquarters. And Bethlehem might be the birthplace. But the Galilee, this region was the place of conception. So it's not circumstantial that, that Paul says this was a set time. If he says it, he said it for a reason. And what made this the set time after 400 years of the prophets being silent? No whispers of the coming Messiah, nothing. What made this the set time? And I don't know that we will ever know that for sure. But there's a prophecy in Isaiah, repeated by Matthew, that does offer an insight into why this is the place. And this is how we're going to look at the Advent story today as we kind of work our way into it. But this story starts way, way, way back in the past. So you're going to have to kind of hang with us as we go through a lot of history here, but we'll do it fairly quickly. But before we do that, I want us to all give a, a head nod and acknowledgement that we love the underdog story, don't we? We do. We just love an underdog story. We embrace the rags to riches tales, the stories of darkness to light from, from uh, rejection to redemption, injustice to justice. We love the stories where at the end things are put right, put in order. We love a story with a happy ending, right? Why else would we subject ourselves to this year after year after year if we didn't love the story of an underdog and didn't love the story of, you know, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat? Zach, would you do that? for the Broncos. Bransky's legs might be critical here to save time on throwing the ball. Down the middle, 
James, the lateral to the corner of the end zone. I love stopping that before he gets to the end zone, right? Oh. La, 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 la. I don't know why we subject ourselves to replays of this now 20 years later, right? This isn't like a real Fiesta Bowl when Oregon State beat Notre Dame by, well, you don't want to know. But we, there's something in us that, that is attracted. A, a rags to riches story is, is magnetic. We love them. Now, centuries before the advent, centuries before the advent, as Joshua is leading the Hebrew people, now that Moses has passed away, and he's leading the Hebrew people into Palestine, and they start settling the land in each family tribe unit. And I was thinking this morning, how can we illustrate that? Think of counties, Idaho counties. So think of a county. Each of the 12 family tribes received a parcel of land as their inheritance. When we get there, and your Bible has a color picture in the back that illustrates the same thing. It's the only color in your Bible, but you know, that's usually where it's at. So they got land as their inheritance with the very clear instruction that as you take possession of your land, you are to push the occupants out. Remove them from the land thoroughly by whatever means you need to, whatever it takes. And so they did. They did it quite aggressively at first and less aggressively as as they went on. And then fast forward over time, 10 of the tribal families, 10 of these counties allied and formed a northern kingdom. The other two formed a southern kingdom. And while the southern kingdom wasn't perfect, they did kind of hold more closely to their Jewish roots and to the law. They observed the law, but not perfectly. But the people of the northern kingdom were more inclined to you know, make some allowances for the native people, the indigenous people that were there. They, they made accommodations for their pagan lifestyles. And after accommodation came full-on adoption of their pagan practices. They, they went from a people being under the guardianship and custodianship of the law, God's people, to people virtually indistinguishable from their neighbors. And then for a time, during the reigns of, of King David and King Solomon, the two kingdoms united. And they were good days. The Hebrew nation was powerful. It was unified. But immediately after David and Solomon, they dispersed. It went through a period of upheaval, of dissension, of rebellion, of political and military coups. It found itself splitting back into these two northern and southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And for all appearances, even though these people are of the same race, that might have been the only thing that they held in common. They just practiced religion that differently. And during this time, God would raise up prophets in both kingdoms. And he'd call people to repentance. And prophets like Elijah and Isaiah and Elisha, who we looked at earlier this fall, they, they pleaded with people, turn around, go the other way, stop doing what you're doing. They said, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, there's going to be judgment. Things are going to be worse than they are now. If there's no ceasing of these pagan practices, if there is no indication that you are making a move toward repentance, there's going to be consequences. In the north, led by a series of corrupt and stubborn kings, repentance was spotty, if at all. And the people just continued living in sin. They neglected the law. They didn't observe the law. They were no different than their pagan neighbors in the nations that surrounded them. Even still, even though they took, they took on that form of religiosity, which was false and phony and pagan and offensive to God, they were still Jewish people. God hadn't left them. They were still subject to the laws of God. And a con 
consequence of this continual disobedience was a state of ongoing conflict in war with nations and empires. Because even though you allow your children to intermarry with your neighbors, with those other practices, people of those other practices, it doesn't necessarily ensure a peaceful coexistence. It doesn't mean just because you have capitulated to your neighbor that all is well and peace is going to reign. It doesn't mean that at all. You're still a different race of people. There will always be political and cultural and racial differences that exist. These points of friction continually. And for the northern kingdom, this became their legacy. Sinful, unrepentant behavior. That's kind of what we know them for in the Old Testament. A refusal to repent. A stubbornness. It became an entire region, an entire kingdom of very little hope, very little joy, very little identity. Because after generations of intermarriage, you know, 1980s, who are you? Who, 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 right? You've lost the thing that held you together as kingdoms, as people. This was your identity and you've lost it. Now, two of these family states, these, what did I call them a minute ago? Yeah, counties, thanks, Brian. Two of these counties bore the brunt of the judgment in the north, the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, when the, the Hebrew people first moved into the promised land centuries before, and it was divided into tribal family counties, Zebulun and Naphtali became border states. They were on the frontier. You know, some tribes got McCall, some tribes got Murphy. You know, some lucked out, some weren't so lucky. And when they first settled, the Hebrew people, by and large, had done as God had instructed. They had indeed pushed people out of the land, and they would occupy it. But you know how it is. The longer you're at war, especially if your tribe and your people and your county is the last to be seized, the longer you're at war, the more you're going to lose your taste for it. The less vigorously you're going to fight. Because why should I leave and go fight naturally when I could be doing things back in Judah on my own property? After all, that's where my tribe is from. You find yourself losing your taste for conflict. And instead of fiercely moving the local inhabitants off the land completely, you begin to cut some corners. You intermarry. You force them into slave labor. And then you end up taking on their pagan religions and their practices. And you become more like them than you ever should have been. This is what brought the prophetic warnings the prophets taught, taught them and, and turned them back toward the idea of if you do this, there is cause and effect. If you do this, there will be judgment. If you do this, if you, if you refuse to repent of your sin, there's going to be judgment. And judgment came, and it came in the form of oppression, of death, of war, exile, and enslavement. Now, with Naphtali and Zebulun. Through this area goes the main route from Egypt to Assyria. It's called the Via Maris. You can Google it when you get home. You can find a Wikipedia page after page after this. This was the route from one empire to another. And it cuts through your county, meaning that every oppressor on your border, they enter your land Number one, you don't know if it's an oppressor or somebody just engaged in commerce. You have no idea. But if it's an army, they hit your border when they are at full strength, right? If somebody wants to, let's say the communist state of Oregon wants to invade Idaho, who's going to bear the brunt? Payette County, right? They are the first people that 
would provide some kind of obstacle. And that fell on these people, Naphtali and Zebulun. Because this highway, this commerce, this trade, plus the war machines travel through here, not good. Plus being at the northern edge of the nation, they are so far away from any military support that could come from the northern kingdom's king. So their life is one of death, oppression, war, famine, lack, and hopelessness. Plus, when you have lost your way and you now look less like what God intended for you and more like your neighbor, when you've lost that common story that gave life meaning, those things that knit you together as a northern and southern kingdom and in the hopes that one day you would be reunited, when you've lost all that, you are really lost. And all of this is to say, if there was ever a place of darkness in the northern kingdom, it's in these two tiny, out of the way, insignificant, meaningless border states, tribal, family, counties, called Zebulun and Naphtali. This is the darkest of the dark of the dark. In the basement of the church, Zach, why don't you go ahead and roll that. We have a closet. It's a dark closet. Please don't judge the uh, cinematic quality of this. This is just an illustration. Inside the closet is another closet. Okay? Up. Inner closet. Flipped off the light, went back into the inner closet. You turn around, flip the light off. I tell you, that is dark. I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor Jim, do you spend a lot of time in there? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. However, it is so dark. I am blessed, and I, I say this with all humility, I'm blessed with a very keen sense of direction. You can drop me anywhere. This isn't a challenge. <laughs> you can place me anywhere, and I will be able to show you north, south, east, west. I just know this. It's, it's hardwired into me. However, if you go into this closet and you spin me around three times and tell me to count to five and then ask me to show you which direction is north, I can't. I have no image to anchor to. All the familiar landmarks are gone. There's no one whispering in my ear saying, this is the way. If there was ever a place on our planet since God made it, if there was a place beyond hope, Zebulun and Naphtali are that place. If there was ever a place devoid of a holy presence, Maybe, maybe even feeling like it was beyond the reach of God. Perhaps this is it. This is Zebulun and Naphtali. This is how it's been for generations. The Assyrians marched through. The Babylonians marched, marched through. Empire after empire has used that route to... Yeah, it hasn't been good. Generations have lived in the darkest part of the dark. But there is no place beyond the redemptive grace and grasp of God. No place. There is no place that God has abandoned. There is no place that he is not present. There is no place that his love can't reach. There is nothing that you have done that can't be forgiven. Nothing. 
There is no one that he will not restore. And our scripture this morning came from Isaiah 9. And as it was on the screen and as Marcy referred to it, we started in verse 2. Now, here's verse 1. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Through, through oppression, through this constant warfare, through their exile and enslavement of their neighbors, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. This is what it had been called because it had been run over so many times by so many different people groups. Galilee of the nations. By the way of the sea, the Via Maris, that east-west highway, beyond the Jordan, on the west side of the Jordan River. This area of darkness that, that lies on their frontier, the one that's lost its faith and can't defend itself, doesn't understand how it has lost its identity, its culture, its heritage, its promise, doesn't understand really generations later where the fall happened. It's about these people, these people living in the darkest of the dark that Isaiah says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Can you imagine? Isaiah says, you have enlarged the nation. Not just property, not just possessions. You've given them something that they can be proud of, something that they can hold on to. You've given them an identity and increased their joy. Now, listen to this, to these people who have just been oppressed and overrun and in the midst of war forever. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. I'm sure they've seen that. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Get this, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. It will be fuel for the fire because you won't need it anymore. For to us, for to us, the people that have lived in darkness for so long, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government, in his peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establish, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal, the enthusiasm, the strength of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This was the prophecy seven centuries before Advent. Seven centuries later, Matthew connects the dots. And this is what he writes. Jesus heard that John had been put in prison. He withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake, where? In the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, where death had for centuries been so prevalent, and this was the darkest of the dark, where sin was a way of life. A light has dawned. And from there, Jesus went calling his disciples. The light didn't come on. People didn't see the light at the birth. They saw it when Jesus returned and began to announce the kingdom of God has come. So what do we take from this? One of the things that it does, and this would take a whole month of Sundays, literally, to unravel and to 
to work our way through, but it helps us understand the protocol of God. And protocol meaning this is the way that God works his will among us. God's habitual way of renewing people and places. God's protocol is to come near the poor, to come near the weak, to come near the overlooked, to come near the broken, to come near the marginalized, to come to those living in the dark of the dark. Now, David in Psalm 113, long before the prophecy of Isaiah, long before Matthew requotes the prophecy, he says this, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Then he says, the Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? Our God is so high above everything else that he has to look down to see heaven, let alone earth. That's how great the God that we serve is. And yet, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Literally, dung heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. God, who has to look down to see heaven, sees us. He saw Zebulun and Naphtali. He finds a broken condition. He finds us sitting in dust and ash and dung of our own construction and lifts us up. And this protocol is woven all throughout the advent. The poor, the needy, the shepherd, the wise men who for some reason are looking for a king who is born into poverty where God uses the poor and the broken to redeem those he loves. And where the first glimmers of Jim's salvation were seen in Zebulun in Naphtali all those years ago. That's where the light came. Mary is from here the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. Mary's from here. Joseph is from here. The angel messenger came and found Mary in Zebulun and Naphtali, this place of dark darkness. Joseph didn't run. Jesus is raised here in this area of dark darkness. Jesus starts his ministry here. When you lay the map, of Zebulun and Naphtali over the top of that region. It covers Galilee, his home. God can handle our brokenness. Nothing we have ever done, no matter how dark we believe it to be, shocks him. Nothing is beyond his reach in his forgiveness. If he can take this story, and not devise a plan that says, okay, well, I'm, we'll leave them to that and we will begin our work over here. He, he doesn't do that. He goes right where the need is urgent, where the people are poor and suffering and broken and don't know that they are. Nothing is beyond his reach. Nothing is beyond his forgiveness. Who does that? The God who looks down from heaven from above heaven, sees the state we're in, says, I have a way out of this for you. 
What a story. You know, we live in a very interesting day and age. And in many ways, Caldwell is our Zebulun and Naphtali. Just as lost. Uh, they, they don't comprehend the state of life. And a lot of people without hope. But the light has come. We are his sons and daughters. He has, he has given us this new life, this new hope. We don't live in fear. And we don't live in the dark. You are the light of the world. And that's what our community needs. It's the light of the world. So let's be all about that. Let's pray. Father, Father, if this had been written up as a business plan, I'm sure it would have been rejected. But you are not a business. And this is far beyond a plan. This is a rescue. Thank you, Father, for rescuing us. Because honestly, we are just as lost, just as in the dark of, as those people many times. But still, you look down and you see us in our condition. You see the state that we're in. And your love is so great that it wants to provide a way out, a way of hope, a ridiculous grace, an incomprehensible love. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this story. Thank you for going to the dark place. We thank you that Jesus, your son, was so obedient. We thank you that he was obedient to the point of death on the cross. And that's what we recognize here this morning, Father, at this table. The bread that represents his broken body and the cup that represents the blood that was spilled. To take away that stain of sin off of us and usher us into the adoption where we are now your sons, your daughters, your children, and heirs. Father, speak to us this season as we uh, wonder at the beauty of the lights, as we walk the streets, as we spend some time downtown. Father, impress on us that we are the light. Father, orchestrate some, some conversations, some trusted conversations that would lead to an acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and King and coming again. Thank you for your goodness to us, Father. Thank you for this season that we get to enjoy. We pray this in your name.